Section 12 of Expository Thoughts on the Gospel of St. John, Volume 1, by J. C. Ryle. Chapter 3, verses 9 to 21. Spiritual Ignorance. God's Love, the Source of Salvation. Christ's Death, the Means of Providing Salvation. Faith, the Instrument which Makes Salvation Ours. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. John chapter 3, verses 9 to 21. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that which we do know, and testify that which we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall ye believe, if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. We have in these verses the second part of the conversation between our Lord Jesus and Nicodemus. A lesson about regeneration is closely followed by a lesson about justification. The whole passage ought always to be read with affectionate reverence. It contains words which have brought eternal life to myriads of souls. These verses show us, firstly, what gross spiritual ignorance there may be in the mind of great and learned man. We see a master of Israel, unacquainted with the first elements of saving religion. Nicodemus is told about the new birth and at once exclaims, How can these things be? When such was the darkness of a Jewish teacher, what must have been the state of the Jewish people? It was indeed due time for Christ to appear. The pastors of Israel had ceased to feed the people with knowledge. The blind were leading the blind, and both were falling into the ditch. Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. Ignorance like that of Nicodemus is unhappily far too common in the Church of Christ. We must never be surprised if we find it in quarters where we might reasonably expect knowledge. Learning and rank and high ecclesiastical office are no proof that a minister is taught by the Spirit. The successors of Nicodemus, in every age, are far more numerous than the successors of St. Peter. On no point is religious ignorance so common as on the work of the Holy Ghost. That old stumbling block, at which Nicodemus stumbled, is as much an offense to thousands in the present day as it was in the days of Christ. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Happy is he who has been taught to prove all things by Scripture, and to call no man master upon earth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. These verses show us, secondly, the original source from which man's salvation springs. That source is the love of God the Father. Our Lord says to Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This wonderful verse has been justly called by Luther, the Bible in miniature. No part of it, perhaps, is so deeply important as the first five words, God so loved the world. The love here spoken of is not that special love with which the Father regards his own elect, but that mighty pity and compassion with which he regards the whole race of mankind. Its object is not merely the little flock which he has given to Christ from all eternity, but the whole world of sinners, without any exception. There is a deep sense in which God loves the world. 
all whom he has created he regards with pity and compassion their sins he cannot love but he loves their souls his tender mercies are over all his works psalm 145 verse 9 christ is god's gracious gift to the whole world let us take heed that our views of the love of god are scriptural and well defined the subject is one on which error abounds on either side on the one hand we must beware of vague and exaggerated opinions we must maintain firmly that god hates wickedness and that the end of all who persist in wickedness will be destruction it is not true that god's love is lower than hell it is not true that god so loved the world that all mankind will be finally saved but that he so loved the world that he gave his son to be the saviour of all who believe his love is offered to all men freely fully honestly and unreservedly but it is only through the one channel of christ's redemption he that rejects christ cuts himself off from god's love and will perish everlastingly on the other hand we must beware of narrow and contracted opinions we must not hesitate to tell any sinner that god loves him it is not true that god cares for none but his own elect or that christ is not offered to any but those who are ordained to eternal life there is a kindness and love in god towards all mankind it was in consequence of that love that christ came into the world and died upon the cross let us not be wise above that which is written or more systematic in our statements than scripture itself god has no pleasure in the death of the wicked god is not willing that any should perish god would have all men trust to be saved god loves the world john chapter 6 verse 32 titus chapter 3 verse 4 first john chapter 4 verse 10 second peter chapter 3 verse 9 first timothy chapter 2 verse 4 ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 these verses show us thirdly the peculiar plan by which the love of god has provided salvation for sinners that plan is the atoning death of christ on the cross our lord says to nicodemus as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life by being lifted up our lord meant nothing less than his own death upon the cross that death he would have us know was appointed by god to be the life of the world john chapter six verse fifty one it was ordained from all eternity to be the great propitiation and satisfaction for man's sin it was the payment by an almighty substitute and representative of man's enormous debt to god when christ died upon the cross our many sins were laid upon him he was made sin for us he was made a curse for us second corinthians chapter five verse twenty one galatians chapter three verse thirteen by his death he purchased pardon and complete redemption for sinners the brazen spirit lifted up in the camp of israel brought health and cure within the reach of all who were bitten by serpents christ crucified in like manner brought eternal life within reach of lost mankind christ has been lifted up on the cross and man looking to him by faith may be saved the truth before us is the very foundation stone of the christian religion christ's death is the christian's life christ's cross is the christian's title to heaven christ lifted up and put to shame on calvary is the ladder by which christians enter into the holiest and are at length landed in glory it is true that we are sinners but christ has suffered for us it is true that we deserve death but christ has died for us it is true that we are guilty debtors but christ has paid our debts with his own blood this is the real gospel on this let us lean while we live to this let us cling when we die christ has been lifted up on the cross and has thrown open the gates of heaven to all believers these verses show us fourthly the way in which the benefits of christ's death are made our own that way is simply to put faith and trust in christ faith is the same thing as believing three times our lord repeats this glorious truth to nicodemus twice he proclaims that whosoever believeth shall not perish once he says he that believeth on the son of god is not condemned faith in the lord jesus is the very key of salvation he that has it has life and he that has it not has not life nothing whatever beside this faith is necessary to our complete justification but nothing whatever except this faith 
will give us an interest in Christ. We may fast and mourn for sin, and do many things that are right, and use religious ordinances, and give all our goods to feed the poor, and yet remain unpardoned and lose our souls. But if we will only come to Christ as guilty sinners, and believe on Him, our sins shall at once be forgiven, and our iniquities shall be entirely put away. Without faith there is no salvation, but through faith in Jesus the vilest sinner may be saved. If we would have a peaceful conscience in our religion, let us see that our views of saving faith are distinct and clear. Let us beware of supposing that justifying faith is anything more than a sinner's simple trust in a Saviour, the grasp of a drowning man on the hand held out for his relief. Let us beware of mingling anything else with faith in the manner of justification. Here we must always remember faith stands entirely alone. A justified man, no doubt, will always be a holy man. True believing will always be accompanied by godly living. But that which gives a man an interest in Christ is not his living, but his faith. If we would know whether our faith is genuine, we do well to ask ourselves how we are living. But if we would know whether we are justified by Christ, there is but one question to be asked. That question is, do we believe? These verses show us, lastly, the true cause of the loss of man's soul. Our Lord says to Nicodemus, This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. The words before us form a suitable conclusion to the glorious tidings which we have just been considering. They completely clear God of injustice in the condemnation of sinners. They show in simple and unmistakable terms that although man's salvation is entirely of God, his ruin, if he is lost, will be entirely from himself. He will reap the fruit of his own sowing. The doctrine here laid down ought to be carefully remembered. It supplies an answer to a common cavil of the enemies of God's truth. There is no decreed reprobation excluding anyone from heaven. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. There is no unwillingness on God's part to receive any sinner, however great his sins. God has sent light into the world, and if man will not come to the light, the fault is entirely on man's side. His blood will be on his own head, if he makes shipwreck of his soul. The blame will be at his own door, if he misses heaven. His eternal misery will be the result of his own choice. His destruction will be the work of his own hand. God loved him, and was willing to save him, but he loved darkness, and therefore darkness must be his everlasting portion. He would not come to Christ, and therefore he could not have life. John chapter 5, verse 40. The truths we have been considering are peculiarly weighty and solemn. Do we live as if we believed them? Salvation by Christ's death is close to us today. Have we embraced it by faith and made it our own? Let us never rest till we know Christ as our own Savior. Let us look to Him without delay for pardon and peace, if we have never looked before. Let us go on believing on Him, if we have already believed. Whosoever is His own gracious word, whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Notes John chapter 3, verses 9 to 21, part 1. Verse 9. Nicodemus answered, How these things be. This is the third and last time that Nicodemus speaks during his visit to Christ, so far as it is reported to us. His question here is a striking and instructive instance of the deep spiritual ignorance which may be found in the mind of a learned man. Four different ways our Lord has brought before him one and the same lesson. First, he had laid down the great principle that every man must be born again. Secondly, he had repeated the same thing in fuller words, and brought in the idea of water, to illustrate the work of the Spirit. Thirdly, he had shown the necessity of the new birth from the natural corruption of man. Fourthly, he had illustrated the work of the Spirit a second time, by the instance of the wind. And yet now, after all that our Lord has said, this learned Pharisee seems utterly in the dark, and asks the pitiable question, how can these things be? We have no right to be surprised at the vast ignorance of saving religion, which we see on all sides, when we consider the history of Nicodemus. We should make up our minds to expect to find spiritual darkness the rule, and spiritual light the exception. 
few things in the long run give so much trouble to ministers missionaries teachers and district visitors as beginning work with extravagant and unscriptural expectations verse ten jesus answered and said it will be observed that our lord does not answer the question of nicodemus directly but rebukes him sharply for his ignorance yet it ought to be carefully noted as melanchthon remarks that before he concludes what he now begins to say he supplies a complete answer to his inquirer he shows him the true root and spring of regeneration namely faith in himself he answers his groping inquiry how can these things be by showing him the first step in saving religion viz to believe in the son of god let nicodemus begin like a little child by simply believing on him who was to be lifted up on the cross and he would soon understand how a man could be born again even in his old age art thou a master of israel the english version of this question hardly gives the full force of the original it should be literally rendered art thou the master of israel i e art thou the famous teacher and instructor of the jews dost thou profess to be a light of them that sit in darkness and an instructor of others the expression certainly seems to indicate that nicodemus was a man of established reputation as a teacher among the pharisees when the teachers were so ignorant what must have been the state of the taught knowest not these things these words unquestionably imply rebuke the things which our lord had just mentioned nicodemus ought to have known and understood he professed to be a religious teacher he professed to know the old testament scriptures the doctrine therefore of the necessity of a new birth ought not to have appeared strange to him a clean heart circumcision of the heart a new heart a heart of stone instead of a heart of flesh were expressions and ideas which he must have read in the prophets and which all pointed toward the new birth psalm fifty one verse ten jeremiah chapter four verse four ezekiel chapter eighteen verse thirty one chapter thirty six verse twenty six his ignorance consequently was deserving of blame the verse before us appears to me to supply a strong argument against the idea that the expression born of water and the spirit means baptism i do not see how nicodemus could possibly have known this doctrine as it is nowhere revealed in the old testament and even its own advocates confine it to new testament times to blame a man for not knowing things which he could not possibly know would be obviously most unjust and entirely at variance with the general tenor of our lord's dealings verse eleven we speak that we do know etc whom does our lord mean here when he says we the answers to this question are various a some think as luther brentius Bucer, gauter aretius hutcheson musculus gomarus piscator and cartwright that we means i and john the baptist b some think as calvin Beza, and scott that it means i and the old testament prophets c some think as alcuin according to maldonatus and wesley that it means i and all who are born of the spirit d some think as chrysostom cyril rupertus colovius glacius chemnitius lamp lay nephalnius cornelius alapide crocius steer and bengal that it means either i and the father or i and the holy ghost or i and both the father and the spirit e some think as theophylact swingle pool and doddridge that our lord only means himself when he says we and that he uses the plural number in order to give weight and dignity to what he says as kings do so also he says whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of god or with what comparison shall we compare it mark chapter four verse thirty we in that text evidently stands for i in st john's first epistle the first person plural is used instead of the singular repeatedly in the first five verses of the first chapter the last of these five opinions appears to me by far the most probable and satisfactory the first three seem to me to be entirely overthrown by john the baptist's words in this chapter verse thirty two where he mentions it as a peculiar mark of our lord's superiority to all other teachers that he testifieth what he hath seen and heard the fourth opinion appears to me untenable the fear of socinianism must not make us wrestle texts in order to apply them to the trinity there is a fitness in our lord's saying during his earthly ministry after his incarnation 
I speak and testify what I have known and seen from all eternity with my father. But there is no apparent fitness in saying that he and the other two persons in the Trinity speak what they have seen. The meaning of the sentence appears to be this. I declare with authority and bear witness to truths which from all eternity I have known and seen, as God in union with the Father and the Holy Ghost. I do not speak, as all merely human ministers must, what I have been taught by others. I do not testify things which I have received as God's servant, as ordinary prophets have, and which I should not have known without God's inspiration. I testify what I have seen with my Father, and knew before the world began. It is like the expression, I speak that which I have seen with my Father. John chapter 8, verse 38. Melanchthon thinks that our Lord, in this verse, contrasts the uncertain traditions and human inventions which the Pharisees taught, with the sure, certain, and irrefragable truths of God, which he came to preach. Busser remarks that the verse contains a practical lesson for all religious teachers. No man has a right to teach unless he is thoroughly persuaded of the truth of which he teaches. Ye receive not our witness. This sentence corresponds so exactly with John the Baptist's words at verse 32, that it confirms me in the opinion that our Lord in this verse only speaks of himself. The words before us, as well as those of John the Baptist, must be taken with some qualification. The greater part of you receive not our testimony. The object of the verse is to rebuke the unbelief of Nicodemus and all who were like-minded with him among the Jews. The use of the plural number, ye, makes it probable that our Lord in this verse refers not merely to what he had just been saying to Nicodemus, but to all his public teaching at Jerusalem, from the time of his casting out the buyers and sellers in the temple. If we do not adopt this theory, we must suppose him to mean, what I have spoken and testified to you about regeneration is what I continually say to all who come, like you, to inquire of me, and yet neither you nor they believe what I say. You all alike stumble at this stumbling-stone, the new birth. Calvin remarks on this expression that we ought never to be surprised at unbelief. If men would not receive Christ's testimony, it is no wonder that they will not receive ours. Verse 12. If I have told, earthly, heavenly things. To see the full force of this verse, we should paraphrase it thus. If ye do not believe what I say when I tell you, as I have done, things that are earthly, how will you believe if I go on, as I shall do, to tell you of things that are heavenly? If you will not believe when ye hear my first lesson, what will ye do when ye hear my second? If ye are stumbled at the very alphabet of my gospel, what will ye do when I proceed to show you higher and deeper truths? The difficulty of the verse lies in the two expressions, earthly things and heavenly things. Our Lord does not explain them, and we are therefore left to conjecture their true meaning. I offer the following explanation with some diffidence as the most satisfactory one. By earthly things, I believe our Lord means the doctrine of the new birth, which he had just been expounding to Nicodemus. By heavenly things, I believe he means the great and solemn truths which he was about immediately to declare, and which he does declare in rapid succession from this verse down to the end of the conversation. These truths were his own divinity, the plan of redemption by his own death on the cross, the love of God to the whole world, and his consequent provision of salvation, faith in the Son of God as the only way to escape hell, and man's willful rejection of light, the only cause of man's condemnation. But why does our Lord call the new birth an earthly thing? I reply that he does so, because it is an earthly thing, compared with his own divinity and atonement. Regeneration is a thing that takes place in man, here upon earth. The atonement is a transaction that was done for man, and of which the special effect is on man's position before God in heaven. In regeneration God comes down to man, and dwells in him upon earth. In the atonement Christ takes up man's nature as man's representative, and as man's forerunner goes up into heaven. Regeneration is a change of which even the men of this world have some faint inkling, and which can be illustrated by such earthly figures as water and wind. Almost every one allows, as Busser remarks, that he is not so good as he should be, and that he needs some change to fit him for heaven. Christ's divinity, and the incarnation, and the atonement, and justification by faith, are such high and heavenly things that man has no natural conception of them. Regeneration is so far an earthly idea that even irreligious men borrow the word and talk of regenerating nations and society. 
salvation by faith in christ's blood is so entirely a heavenly thing that it is constantly misunderstood hated and sneered at by unconverted men when therefore our lord calls the new birth an earthly thing we must understand that he does so comparatively in itself the new birth is a high holy and heavenly thing but compared with the doctrine of the incarnation and atonement it is an earthly thing verse thirteen and no man hath ascended etc this verse according to my view contains the first heavenly thing which our lord displays to nicodemus but the sentence is undeniably a difficult one and commentators differ widely as to its meaning some think as calvin musculus bullinger hutcheson poole quesnell schottgen dyke lightfoot lee doddridge a clark and steer that our lord here shows to nicodemus in highly figurative language the necessity of divine teaching in order to understand spiritual truth no child of adam has ever reached the lofty mysteries of heaven and made himself acquainted with its high and holy truths by his own natural understanding such knowledge is only possessed by the incarnate saviour the son of man who has come down from heaven if you would know spiritual truth you must sit at his feet and learn of him this view of the text is supported by proverbs chapter thirty verse thirty four according to this view the verse must be taken in close connection with the preceding one where the ignorance of nicodemus is exposed some think as wingle melanchthon brentius aretius flacius and ferris that our lord here shows to nicodemus and again in highly figurative language the impossibility of human merit and the utter inability of man justifying himself and obtaining an entrance into heaven by his own righteousness no one can possibly ascend into god's presence in heaven and stand perfect and complete before him except the incarnate saviour who has come down from heaven to fulfil all righteousness i am the way to heaven if you would enter heaven you must believe on the son of man and become a member of his body by faith this view of the text appeals for support to romans chapter ten verses six to nine according to this view the verse must be taken in close connection with the following verse in which the way of justification is explained the true view of the text i venture to think is as follows the words of the text are to be taken literally our lord begins his list of heavenly things by declaring to nicodemus his own divine nature and dignity he reminds him that no one has ever ascended literally into heaven where god dwells enoch and elijah and david for instance were doubtless in a place of bliss when they left this world but they had not ascended into heaven acts chapter two verse thirty four but that which no man not even the holiest saint has attained was the right and prerogative of him in whose company nicodemus was the son of man had dwelt from all eternity in heaven had come down from heaven would one day ascend again into heaven and in his divine nature was actually in heaven one with god the father at that very moment know who it is to whom you are speaking i am not merely a teacher come from god as you say i am the messiah the son of man foretold by daniel i have come down from heaven according to promise to save sinners i shall one day ascend again into heaven as the victorious forerunner of a saved people above all i am as god in heaven at this moment i am he who fills heaven and earth I prefer this view of the verse to any other for two reasons for one thing it gives a literal meaning to every word in the text for another it seems a fitting answer to the first idea which nicodemus had put forward in the conversation viz that our lord was only a teacher come from god it is the view which is in the main held by rollock colovius and gomarus and expounded by them with much ability the greek word which we render but i am inclined to think ought to be taken in an adversative rather than an acceptive sense instances of this usage will be found in matthew chapter twelve verse four mark chapter thirteen verse thirty two luke chapter four verses twenty six and twenty seven john chapter seventeen verse twelve revelation chapter nine verse four chapter twenty one verse twenty seven the thought appears to be man has not and cannot ascend into heaven but that which man cannot do i the son of man can do heaven throughout this verse must be taken in the sense of that immediate and peculiar presence of god which we can conceive of and express in no other form than by the word heaven the expression which is in heaven deserves particular notice 
it is one of those many expressions in the new testament which can be explained in no other way than by the doctrine of christ's divinity it would be utterly absurd and untrue to say of any mere man that at the very time he was speaking to another on earth he was in heaven but it can be said of christ with perfect truth and propriety he never ceased to be very god when he became incarnate he was with god and was god as god he was in heaven while he was speaking to nicodemus the expression is one which no socinian can explain away if christ was only a very holy man and nothing more he could not have used these words the socinian explanation for the former part of the verse viz that christ was caught up into heaven after his baptism and there instructed about the gospel he was to teach would be of itself utterly absurd and a mere theory invented to get over a difficulty but the conclusion of the verse is a blow at the very root of the socinian system it is written not only that christ came down from heaven but that he is in heaven it admits of a question whether the greek words we translate which is do not both here and in chapter one verse eighteen point to that peculiar name of jehovah which was doubtless familiar to nicodemus the ever-existing one the living one it is the same phrase which forms part of christ's name in revelation him which is revelation chapter one verse four much of the difficulty of the verse is removed by remembering that the past tense hath ascended admits of being rendered with equal grammatical correctness does ascend can ascend or will ascend pierce takes this view and quotes in support of it john chapter one verse twenty six chapter three verse eighteen chapter five verse twenty four chapter six verse sixty nine chapter eleven verse twenty seven chapter twenty verse twenty nine Whitby thinks that throughout this verse our Lord has in view a rabbinical tradition that Moses had been into heaven to receive the law, and that he declares the falsehood of this tradition by saying, No man, not even Moses, has ascended into heaven. Verse 14. As Moses lifted, serpent, so must, etc., etc. In this verse our Lord proceeds to show Nicodemus another heavenly thing, viz., the necessity of his own crucifixion. Nicodemus probably thought, like most Jews, that when Messiah appeared he would come with power and glory to be exalted and honored by men. Jesus tells him that so far from this being the case, Messiah must be cut off at his first advent and put to an open shame by being hanged on a tree. He illustrates this by a well-known event in the history of Israel's wanderings, the story of the brazen serpent. Numbers chapter 21 verse 9 are you expecting me to take to myself power and to restore the kingdom of israel cast away such a vain expectation i have come to do very different work i have come to suffer and to offer up myself as a sacrifice for sin the mention of moses of whom the pharisees thought so much was eminently calculated to arrest the attention of nicodemus even moses in whom ye trust has supplied a most vivid type of my great work on earth the crucifixion the son of man must be lifted up the expression son of man was doubtless intended to remind nicodemus of daniel's prophecy of the messiah the greek word rendered must signifies it behoveth that it is necessary that it is necessary in order that god's promises of a redeemer may be fulfilled the types of the old testament sacrifice may be accomplished the law of god be satisfied and a way for god's mercy be provided in order to all this messiah must suffer in our stead the phrase lifted up appears to me most decidedly to mean lifted up on the cross for one thing we find it so explained in this gospel john chapter twelve verses thirty two and thirty three for another the illustration of the brazen serpent makes it absolutely necessary to explain it so to apply the phrase as calvin and others do to the necessity of lifting up and exalting christ's atonement in christian teaching seems to me a mistake it is needlessly dragging in an idea which the words were not intended to convey it is truth no doubt and truth abundantly taught in scripture but not the truth of this text the main points of resemblance in the comparison as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness form a subject which requires careful handling the lifting up of the serpent of brass for the relief of israel when bitten by the serpents is evidently selected by our lord as an apt illustration of his own crucifixion for sinners but how far may we press this illustration where are we to stop 
what are the exact points at which the type and antitype meet? These questions require consideration. Some see a meaning in the brass, of which the serpent was made, as a shining metal, a strong metal, etc., etc. I cannot see it. Our Lord does not even mention the brass. Some see in the serpent hanging on the pole a type of the devil, the old serpent, bruised by Christ's death on the cross and openly triumphed over on it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. I cannot see this at all. It appears to me to confound and mingle up two scriptural truths which ought to be kept distinct. Moreover, there is something revolting in the idea that in order to be healed, the Israelite had to look at a figure of the devil. Some see in Moses lifting up the serpent a type of the law of God requiring payment of its demands and becoming the cause of Christ dying on the cross. On this I will content myself with saying that I am not satisfied that this idea was in Christ's mind. The points of resemblance appear to me to be these. A. As the Israelites were in sore distress and dying from the bites of poisonous serpents, so is man in great spiritual danger and dying from the poisonous effects of sin. B. As the serpent of brass was lifted up on a pole in the sight of the camp of Israel, so Christ was to be lifted up on the cross publicly and in the sight of the whole nation at the Passover. C. As the serpent, lifted up on the pole, was an image of the very thing which had poisoned the Israelites, even so Christ had in himself no sin, and yet was made and crucified in the likeness of sinful flesh, and counted sin. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. The brazen serpent was a serpent without poison, and Christ was a man without sin. The thing which we should specially see in Christ crucified is our sin laid upon him, and him counted as a sinner, and treated as a sinner, and punished as a sinner, for our redemption. In fact, we see on the cross our sins punished, crucified, born, and carried by our Redeemer. D. Finally, as the one way by which Israelites obtained relief from the brazen serpent was by looking at it, so the one way to get benefit from Christ is to look at him by faith. The feeblest look brought cure to an Israelite, and the weakest faith, if true and sincere, brings salvation to sinners. It should be carefully noted that it seems impossible to reconcile this verse with that modern divinity which can see nothing in Christ's death but a great act of self-sacrifice, and which denies Christ's substitution for us on the cross and the imputation of our sins to him. Such divinity withers up such a verse as this entirely, and cuts out the life, heart, and marrow of its meaning. Unless words are most violently wrested from their ordinary signification, the illustration before us points directly towards two great truths of the gospel. One of them is that Christ's death upon the cross was meant to have a medicinal, health-conferring effect upon our souls, and that there was something in it far above a mere martyr's example. The other truth is, that when Christ died upon the cross, he was dealt with as our substitute and representative, and punished, through the imputation of our sins, in our place. The thing that Israel saw on the pole, and from which they got health, was an image of the very serpent that bit them. The object that Christians should see on the cross is a divine person, made sin and a curse for them, and allowing that very sin that has poisoned the world to be imputed to him, and laid upon his head. It is easy work to sneer at the words, vicarious sacrifice, and imputed merit, as nowhere to be found in Scripture. But it is not so easy to disprove the fact that the ideas are constantly to be met with in the Bible. The use of the brazen serpent in this verse, as an illustration of Christ's death and its purpose, must not be abused and made an excuse for turning every incident of the history of Israel in the wilderness into an allegory. It is very important not to attach an allegorical meaning to Bible facts without authority. Such things as the manna, the smitten rock, and the brazen serpent are allegorized for us by the Holy Ghost. But where the Holy Ghost has not pointed out an allegory, we ought to be very cautious in our assertions that allegory exists. Bucer's remarks on this subject deserve reading. Verse 15. That whosoever believeth not perish life. In this verse our Lord declares to Nicodemus, the great end and purpose for which the Son of Man was to be lifted up on the cross, and the way in which the benefits of his crucifixion become our own. In interpreting the verse, we should carefully remember that the comparison of the serpent lifted up in the wilderness must be carried through to the end of the sentence. 
the son of man must be lifted up on the cross that whosoever believeth on him or looks to him by faith as the israelites looked to the brazen serpent should not perish in hell the expression whosoever deserves special notice it might have been equally well translated every one it is intended to show us the width and breadth of christ's offers of salvation they are for every one without exception that believeth the expression believeth in him is deeply important it describes that one act of man's soul which is needful to give him an interest in jesus christ it is not a mere belief of the head that there is such a person as jesus christ and that he is a savior it is a belief of the heart and will when a person feeling his desperate need by reason of sin flees to jesus christ and trusts him leans on him and commits his soul entirely to him as his saviour and redeemer he is said in the language of the text to believe on him the simpler our views of faith are the better the more steadily we keep in view the israelite looking at the brazen serpent the more we shall understand the words before us believing is neither more nor less than heart looking whosoever looked at the brazen serpent was made well however ill he was and however feeble his look just so whosoever looks to jesus by faith is pardoned however great his sins may have been and however feeble his faith did the israelite look that was the only question in the matter of being healed from the serpent's bite does the sinner believe that is the only question in the matter of being justified and pardoned looking to moses or looking to the tabernacle or looking even to the pole on which the serpent hung or looking to anything except the brazen serpent the bitten israelite would not have been cured just so looking to anything but christ crucified however holy the object looked at may be the sinner cannot be saved the expression should not perish but have eternal life is peculiarly strong as the israelite who looked at the brazen serpent not only did not die of his wounds but recovered complete health so the sinner who looks to jesus not only escapes hell and condemnation but has a seed of eternal life at once put in his heart receives a complete title to an eternal life of glory and blessedness in heaven and enters into that life after death the salvation of the gospel is exceedingly full it is not merely being pardoned it is being counted completely righteous and made a citizen of heaven it is not merely an escape from hell but the reception of a title to heaven it has been well remarked that the old testament generally promised only length of days but the gospel promises everlasting life end of section 12